Namaskaram uh, and welcome everyone uh, to, to today's uh, uh, video, today's uh, interview. We have today, uh, we have uh, Rajiv Thakkar sir. Uh, he is, uh, everyone knows, uh, he is uh, Parag Parag's uh, fund manager and uh, CEO. And I am always a big fan of him. I always uh, uh, follow his uh, wherever articles comes and everywhere. And uh, wherever possible, whatever I can learn, I, I, I learn. It. And uh, finally, I got the courage to approach him and ask him if he can come for an interview. And uh, he has given the time. And uh, it's a, so kind of you, sir. Uh, uh, and um, he's a CFA, he's a CA, uh, a post accountant, and uh, he has many uh, educational background also. And he's been with uh, PPFS from 2001, and uh, he's continuing his journey with uh, PPFS. And uh, he's helping a lot of investors, uh, those who are serious with the long term investors, he's helping with them. Uh, you know, he's handling their money seriously. So, welcome, sir, to Money Talks with Nikhil. And thank you for the opportunity. It's a, it's a privilege. We Kerala audience can listen to you through this channel. Uh, sir, uh, could you please uh, take us through this journey, your educational background and your journey with uh, uh, PPFS and helping people with uh, uh, money management? Okay, so I'm a person who's been born and brought up in Mumbai. So uh, my educational background you have covered, uh, I did my graduation in commerce and I did my chartered accountancy and cost accountancy. And later on, uh, I uh, pursued the uh, CFA curriculum, and uh, now I am a CFA charter holder. Uh, initial years, so I joined the financial markets in 1994, and the first uh, seven years was across various fields. So I have uh, worked in investment banking, where we would uh, help companies come out with IPOs, I've been in corporate finance where uh, I was managing the fundraising for my organization in terms of the uh, bank lines and uh, things like that. I've been on the fixed income brokerage desk where uh, you uh, transact in government securities and bonds between banks and financial institutions. Uh, so uh, I've done various uh, things in my career. And in terms of professionally managing money, that has been uh, something that I did from 2003 onwards. Uh, so first 10 years, it was in the portfolio management services area. And 2013 onwards, uh, I've been managing the mutual fund. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, when when uh, we speak about uh, PPFS as a company, uh, Parag Parag Sar is always uh, inspiration. And uh, his books, uh, I read it and I used to watch his uh, videos, which is published in your website also. And uh, uh, could you please uh, share your experience working with him and learnings uh, from him? So I joined uh, my organization in 2001. But even before that, I had uh, some familiarity with uh, Mr. Parag Parik or Parag Bhai, as we used to call him, uh, because he used to write articles for magazines. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was for Outlook Money or Outlook Business, one of the two. And he would write on a subject, which at that time I had no, not heard of, and the subject was behavioral finance. Uh, so in the curriculum, we learn about compound interest rate formula, discount dead cash flow, and things like that. But uh, I was uh, puzzled as to what is this behavioral finance thing. And that's where I learned that apart from the mathematics and the formulae of finance, what matters is the investor behavior and the psychology of the investors, where they uh, end up doing wrong things because of the cycles of greed and uh, fear and things like that. So that was the earliest impression of okay. him. And I got to know him as a person from 2001 onwards. And he's been a mentor and he 
uh, influenced the entire organization and he was instrumental in developing the investment culture, the long-term thinking, uh, the approach of not taking shortcuts in either investing process or uh, in terms of dealing with various people. So, okay. That's yeah, it's difficult to describe in words. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. Uh, even when I was uh, initially, I'm talking about uh, initially when I uh, got introduced to uh, Paraksa's uh, uh, videos and some uh, those days I, I used to read regularly uh, his books and everything. So, so uh, because he's he was talking something different. Then I was talking to uh, my uh, uh, wife and telling that uh, he's talking to become more of a uh, do yoga and uh, you know and, and meditation and stuff like that. Then. Uh, getting into numbers and everything. So uh, that, that was a very different view coming from me. And uh, and when I subscribe firstly uh, to your product also, the kind of uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, browsers and everything got to us also entirely different from other. Uh, I think those days, I don't know these days you are sending it, but those days you used to send everything uh, by post. And that was a very uh, knowledgeable thing. And uh, and the, the way we think was entirely different those days. Uh, and uh, even um, even in, in, in the articles also, you were very uh, vocal what you are doing. And yearly you are doing this annual conference also. And just like uh, Warren Buffett's uh, yearly annual conference, you are doing that in uh, Mumbai. And uh, yeah, uh, so far I haven't got the fortune to come and attend, but uh, one day I, I, I want to come and attend that session. But I, I, I have watched it uh, in YouTube. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, very openly, you all are speaking about what you're doing and uh, what is the state of emotion and everything. Uh, and coming back to uh, money management as such, so uh, it's, a, it's a very rare opportunity we get to talk to a person like you. And uh, when we see about money, we, when we interact with a lot of people, uh, we speak to people who are uh, settled and they are doing serious uh, job or business. They are at the end of their uh, career and uh, looking for retirement, uh, done with a few of their responsibilities or about to finish their responsibilities. But looking at the youngsters, uh, the fresher who got the job or they are not yet started investing, so how do you give an advice for a person uh, not started investing in the early stage of their career to take up their investing journey? Sure. I think the first confusion that young people have is that they cannot distinguish between what is investing and what is trading or speculation. And uh, I don't blame them. I blame the... Uh, environment. So if you uh, consume any kind of media, whether social media, whether print or whether electronic media, there will be tips around futures and options, buying, selling. Uh, today you should do this, tomorrow you should do that. That is actually not investing. That is unfortunately something which is called trading. And I am not passing any value judgment here. It's not a moral argument. It's just that if you and I were to sit down and play cards and gamble with money, both of us cannot win, right? If you win, by definition, I have to lose. And when we add up the winnings and losses, the total will be zero. Uh, same way in trading, if you have to win, someone else has to lose. And at the aggregate, that does not generate economic wealth for all the participants. Investing can be different. If you and I uh, were to pool our money together and start a restaurant in Mumbai uh, selling wonderful Kerala cuisine, and if that restaurant works well, both of us can earn a profit out of that venture. So that is investing. Investing is buying shares and when you buy shares you own a piece of the company you become partners with the tatas bidlas ambanis the government of india various people who have their businesses listed and over a period of time you partake of the profits that those 
business organizations uh, generate. So that's the first difference. Uh, investing over the long run is very, very profitable. Trading can be profitable for some, but that has to result in losses for the other. And the newer people typically are the losing people. Uh, people who do in day in and day out and who have uh, created expertise of fooling other people will effectively come out on tops. Yeah, so uh, this is a new trend because uh, if you look at uh, any social media or anywhere, uh, people who are working in one particular job, they uh, end up talking about uh, uh, stock market in their cafeteria and uh, that end up uh, venturing into the trading uh, field. And they all want to make a extra uh, money. So, uh, what's your take on um, uh, you know, having that multiple source of income? Because these days, that multiple source of income also a different topic of discussion. And that is the main reason people are coming to stock market with the view that they want to create income out of it. Uh, so, sir, what's your take on uh, having a multiple source of income when you're working in a, uh, one serious job or uh, or serious business, uh, you know, uh, what is the need of that? And what's your take on that? Sure. So I'll probably disappoint a lot of people uh, who are watching this, but when you invest, either you can generate income or you can generate wealth and not both. Right? So if you have 1 lakh of rupees today and you make a fixed deposit in a bank, uh, you may get 7 quarter or 7.5 in the present environment. That can be your additional source of income. Uh, so that will generate 7,000 rupees or 7.5,000 rupees for you over the next one year. Uh, this everyone understands, obviously. Uh, but again, that 7,000, 7,500 is not really your income because uh, there is inflation to take into account and there are taxes to take into account. So typically when we talk about investing, uh, in the earlier years for young people, it's all about generating wealth. That wealth can help them in large asset purchases down the road whether they are looking to buy a home or a vehicle or some big milestone expenses in the family in terms of education or marriage related expenses or for retirement. It's all about saving a part of your money each month and investing it to create future wealth. Uh, a lot of people think that we will put a small amount of money and suddenly we'll start generating extra income every month and plus our wealth will grow. Uh, investing is not buying a lottery ticket. Uh, let me put it that way. <laughs> okay. Uh, sir, uh, when, when, when we look about uh, you know, what you're mentioning, it, uh, it, it involved a lot of responsibilities. It involved uh, retirement and everything. So in, in before investing, uh, what is the kind of role a person should do for personal finance? And what is the need of doing that uh, financial planning before investing. So could you please uh, you know, take your views on uh, having a financial planning uh, before investing and what, uh, how, how a person should really enter into an investing journey? Sure. So if you go out of the house and get onto a vehicle, either a two-wheeler or four-wheeler, unless you know the direction where you want to go, you will keep going around in circles. So if you don't have a destination in mind, uh, where will you go? So having a financial plan is all about having a destination and having goals in mind. So typically in the morning, if someone leaves the house, then you may have a goal that, oh, I'll drop my children to school and then I need to buy this thing from this shop and then I'll go to my place of work. So there are three goals in the mind and you also have the order in which you want to reach those goals. First, you will drop kids, then you will buy something and then you will go to office. Same way in our lives, we may have goals. Uh, in seven years, I need to buy a home 
or in uh, this much time i have the college admission for children or i will retire at this age and i'll need this much corpus so all these kind of goals are there uh, i need to buy this kind of life insurance policy as a risk cover i need to buy this kind of a medical insurance policy for uh, my family so all these are plans unless you have plans you can't implement anything so unless you have a blueprint from a, a civil engineer or an architect you can't construct a home you can't just randomly start laying bricks and cement so it's all about having a plan in the first place okay uh, you know when, when we uh, we spoke about uh, uh, people are getting confused at trading and uh, 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 investing and uh, when when there are people who are uh, seriously coming to the market with the view that they want to invest because they want to learn that also that art of investing so uh, for example if a person is uh, investing in shares so according to you what is the minimum checks that person should be doing before picking a stock uh, i know that you know the people will not be doing the kind of research you are doing but uh, at least uh, someone is buying something what is it minimum thing other than taking a tip from someone else uh, could you please throw some light on that sure so uh, firstly when you are looking at equity investing uh, you need to decide whether you want to do it on your own or you want to give it to a professional to do it and i am not saying right or wrong uh, now one person may be very fond of cooking food at home and may have good experience in this and um, may have a lot of interest and uh, everyone would be praising that person for that person's cooking skills by all means do it at home but if you don't have the capability or you don't have the time or uh, you don't have the patience then you can go out to a restaurant or you can employ a cook so same way in equity investing you can directly choose your stocks or you can outsource it to a professional either in terms of a mutual fund or a portfolio manager or nps scheme or various vehicles are available for that so that is the first decision to make whether you want to do it on your own or not and just like cooking it may look very very simple but it takes a certain amount of effort and uh, interest to learn that as a skill uh, while watching someone else do it it looks very very simple but when you actually try to do it it's not that simple so i'll lay down some of the things that a individual investor should look at to buy a stock on his own or on her own uh, uh, in her own demat account so let me start with a story a panchatantra story uh, here a scorpion was about to drown in a river and wanted to go to the other side and luckily for the scorpion the scorpion uh, could see a frog in the river so scorpion called out to the frog saying why don't you take me on your back and take me to the uh, shore of the river and please help me so the frog says no no i have been warned against people like you you are known to bite people and poison people with your bite and people die so uh, i'll not take you on my back so scorpion says what you what do you have to fear if i bite you and you drown i will drown with you uh, you are completely safe so the frog found logic in that answer and the frog allowed the scorpion to come on its back after going a few feet the scorpion immediately bit the frog the frog was in lot of pain and the frog asked why did you do this to me i'll drown and you will also drown so the scorpion's answer was that i should not have bitten you but it's in my habit and my nature and i cannot resist that <laughs> <laughs> right so the first step to for a individual investor to take 
whenever buying shares of any company is to figure out who is running that company in terms of the promoter and the management. If the promoters and management of that company are known in the past to be in trouble with the government for tax evasion or for violation of laws or with their customers for providing faulty products or with their suppliers for not paying back on time or with their lenders for not repaying loans in time. If they have any bad history, stay away from such people. Don't go on the promises. So don't be like the frog. Stay away from the scorpion. That's rule number one. Okay. The second thing to watch out for is that stay away from companies which on their balance sheet have a lot of borrowings. Now, you cannot be an individual investor without having some basic knowledge of accounting or some basic knowledge of finance. You should at least be able to open an annual report or you should be able to go to a website and look at their balance sheet, profit and loss to figure out how much has this company borrowed money from the bank. If that borrowed money is too big a proportion as compared to their business operations, then that company is very, very risky. That's the second thing to uh, watch out for. The third thing to watch out for is out of the funds that the company has invested in their business, how much profit are they able to make out of it? So, which is called return on equity. Uh, as in our earlier conversation, we spoke about how bank fixed deposit rates are 7.5%. Now, if a company is running a business and is not able to generate even 5% on their business investment, then why would you invest in such a company? You should be better off investing in a bank FD. If that company is making 15% or 20% return on its equity or on net worth, then that business is a decent business too investing. And the final thing to look at is the valuation of the company. So various methods are there. Uh, it's probably beyond the scope of our talk today. But you can look at some basic things like what is the price earning ratio or what is the dividend yield, what is the price to book. Uh, the Theoretically correct method is to do discounted cash flow, but that's a bit complicated for a lay investor. People can look at the price earning ratio and things like that, growth rates and things like that. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's it's uh, hearing from you. This is a real gem. I think you know. I, I'm sure that uh, uh, you know this. This uh, at least uh, request is that anyone who is investing in DMAT account check this. Uh, four items what sir has mentioned that that, that will uh, you know kind of ensure that you are not gambling uh, you are at least uh, knowing what you're doing otherwise you always have mutual fund uh, and sir uh, could you explain in shorter version that what is mutual fund uh, we have always heard it a lot of advertisement is there but according to you sir, uh, what is mutual fund so mutual fund is a pool of money, right? So uh, if I put in 100 rupees and you put in 200 rupees and together we have 300 rupees, which we invest in a basket of shares, those share prices will go up and down, right? Now, if this 300 rupees goes to, let's say 450 rupees, which is one and a half times, your 200 will go to 300 and my 100 will go to 150. So we will be part owners of that pool in the same proportion as what we have put in the money. And the additional benefit is that people can invest in the fund and withdraw from the fund on an ongoing basis. And the entry and exit is based on the 
current value of the investments, which is reflected in what is called the net asset value or the NAV. So it's a pool of money of lakhs of investors and they all participate in the underlying business of the shares which are there. So equity mutual funds invest in shares of companies and debt mutual funds invest in either bonds or government securities or treasury bonds. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And, and in, in, in uh, this part of our audience, Kerala have a, a very good penetration for FDs and uh, we have a lot of small banks, small power societies and uh, thanks to that there are a lot of penetration and we have a lot of uh, investors into uh, insurance, then we have a lot of investors into gold, we have a lot of investors into real estate uh, and when we speak about equity, more of a uh, speculation or uh, gambling uh, that is what uh, people usually talk i'm not talking about everyone but there is a lot of awareness happens there are a lot of serious investors are there that is all are happening so uh, 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 talking about these kind of investors and uh, now ft right also higher and in this scenario what is the pros and cons of uh, being this kind of investor and what is the additional flavor uh, people can bring and make their investment journey much more better? Sure. So you have discussed a lot of the popular asset classes for uh, the retail investors. Uh, one additional asset class probably people are uh, enthused about, and I think that is true for Kerala as well, is the real estate, apart from the uh, things that you mentioned, buying a plot of land or home, etc. So let's take them one by one. FD will give you 7.5% return, uh, out of which 6% odd will account for inflation. So if you have 100 rupees today, after one year, you will have 107.50. But the prices will go up from 100 to 106. So the growth in your purchasing power is very, very small. And especially if you are in the tax bracket where you have to pay tax on your interest, then many a times the post-tax return is lower than the inflation rate. So uh, FD may look safe, may look attractive, but really it's not that attractive if you factor in inflation and tax rates. Still, there will be a set of people, retirees, or there will be people who are very, very uh, risk averse. They may choose uh, some of these products. But uh, otherwise, I think uh, people should also look at debt mutual funds, which uh, have the possibility of uh, inflation indexing or uh, have the possibility of giving a slightly better return. So that's as far as the FDs go. Gold has done reasonably okay for investors, but I'll just give a data point. The uh, price of gold per one gram somewhere in the late 80s or somewhere in the early 80s uh, was 100 rupees per gram. And roughly even uh, BSE Sensex was around 100. So that Sensex has gone up to 60,000 and that other thing would be around 6,000. So uh, these are rough numbers I'm saying, but equity as a whole has done much better than uh, gold over the long period of time. But gold also has done reasonably well uh, when we compare it to uh, some other asset classes like bank fixed deposit. So given the uh, steep depreciation of the rupee over the years, gold has managed to at least hold purchasing power over the longer run. Today, there is a option for retail investors to also invest in sovereign gold bonds where the uh, capital gains are tax-free and plus they get a small amount of interest also while they are owning it and they don't have to worry about uh, the difference in buying and selling price and uh, things like that. So that again is a alternative for people. 
real estate has also done reasonably okay but it depends on which location and it has the hassle of uh, very steep transaction costs again it's not divisible so if you need a small amount of money you can't sell 10 percent of your house you have to sell the full house or not sell it so liquidity is not there divisibility is not there transaction costs are high so that is the issue and then we have uh, equity as a asset class which is as i said has done quite well over the long run but there are periods where it gives zero to negative returns so one has to be really prepared to be in it for the long term so there could be two or three years where returns are not there as we are speaking last one one and a half years prices have not gone up in any meaningful way they are either flat or slightly downwards. So one has to be prepared for such periods when one is looking at investing. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. I think very well uh, put it. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, this, these are uh, lessons everyone can think about it and make sure that, uh, you know, what is really comfortable to uh, each individual and uh, requirement also. So it's not just safety, but uh, you need a growth also. Uh, so uh, when we look at uh, look at your personal investment, uh, 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 how do you really plan? And uh, I have always heard that uh, you you are you you invest more into your fund also. And uh, uh, when when you as an investor look at it, uh, uh, how do you diversify yourself, uh, or uh, how do you really look at concentration? So could you please think about it? Uh, just just give a, your own experience of investing. Sure. So, uh, it's a personal uh, preference for various people. So, what I do may not necessarily be uh, relevant for a lot of people who are watching this and uh, people have to take their own decision. But typically, uh, business owners have this problem because most of their capital would be tied up in a particular business. Now, doesn't matter whether the business owner is a large business owner or a small business owner, but a lot of their net worth would be tied in the business assets. Uh, so given that I have been working in my organization for a long time, a lot of my uh, resources are in the stock of the company where I work. So uh, it may not be the best example for a person who's just starting off on their uh, career or on their investment journey. Uh, but generally, it is said that younger people, uh, people in their 20s and 30s, can afford to invest a bigger portion of their savings into equity-related assets. And as they come closer to their retirement age, uh, in their late 40s or in 50s, they should move at least part of the money into debt securities. Now, one good part is that uh, most people have, uh, if they are in the formal sector, they have uh, employees provident fund and they have the gratuity, uh, which is paid by the employer. Most of that money goes into debt securities. So uh, remaining, they can bulk of it, they can put in equities. Uh, when you are investing in equity, it's important not to concentrate it too much. So uh, let's say if you put all your money into one company and that company gets into trouble, uh, then uh, people would suffer a huge amount of uh, loss. We have seen companies uh, go close to zero or zero in many cases. Uh, right now in the news media, uh, there is this uh, uh, think about an American bank, Silicon Valley bank, uh, where the shareholders have seen the entire value of their shares getting wiped out virtually overnight. So that is the risk from buying only one company. So uh, retail individuals should either buy mutual funds or they should have not more than uh, 4 or 5% of their overall equity investment in one particular company. Thank you. And sir, what's your take on, um, you know, investing in 
uh, index fund because these days the trend is coming up and uh, talking about ETF uh, passive investment or mutual fund passive investment. So what is your take on uh, these kind of investment now? Correct. So that is a very good option for people who are starting out where they don't want or they don't have the uh, time and resources to go through various options or various different fund houses and uh, which fund house uh, and which scheme actually meets their need and things like that. If they don't want to spend too much time on it or they don't have the experience, buying a nifty 50 index fund is a simple way of doing it where they get uh, exposure to the top 50 Indian companies and they participate in the economic growth of India. And over a period of time, the uh, index committee automatically removes companies which are not doing well and includes new companies. So the investor does not have to do anything about figuring out which stocks to buy, which stocks to sell. The index committee and the fund do it automatically on their own. Okay, very good. I think uh, that's uh, for a beginner. It's definitely they can uh, think about uh, doing uh, this kind of investment. But uh, uh, over a period of time, uh, people need uh, diversification also. And uh, what is your uh, take on bringing uh, the international uh, uh, companies into your portfolio, uh, especially US, uh, uh, you know, companies? So at what stage people really need to add uh, other countries' uh, company also into their portfolio? I would think they should add other countries to the portfolio virtually from day one. That is my view. Uh, although it's not easy these days, given that uh, the mutual fund industry has uh, hit its overall investment limit and they cannot invest further in foreign stocks. But I'll tell you why it is important. Uh, India is a growing country. We all stay here, live here. We are positive on the prospects of India. But at the same time, there are country-specific events which create some risk for the portfolio. For example, if there's a border tension or war with like situation with one of our neighbors or there is a uh, uh, terrorist attack or uh, sometimes there could be political instability for whatever reason there is uh, fluctuation in the Indian market and that may not reflect necessarily in the global markets. So having some money in global stocks gives you that diversification. So that is one reason to invest abroad. The second reason is that Although Indian market is well diversified and you have hundreds of good companies listed here, but there are still sectors where uh, we don't have good listed Indian companies. So, for example, we don't have a chip manufacturing company in India. So, the uh, computer chips that go into all our devices, these are either Taiwanese or American and uh, things like that. So, you don't have a TSMC kind of company or you don't have a Intel kind of company in India. Uh, you don't have innovator pharma companies uh, like Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson. You uh, don't have too many e-commerce companies here. So the two large ones uh, in India, Amazon and Flipkart, are both foreign-owned. Flipkart owned by uh, Walmart and Amazon, of course, is a listed company in the U.S. So if you want to buy a Google, Apple, you have to go abroad. Right? You don't get a Microsoft to invest in India. Okay. okay. So very good. Uh, I think uh, when it comes to uh, investors, so uh, over a period of time, people uh, increase their wealth, their participation in equity goes up and everything. Right? So uh, what stage we need to bring PMS into uh, their uh, portfolio or what is the real need of having uh, PMS in, in everyone's portfolio? If, if you could just talk about what is PMS also, uh, then uh, because you, you, you manage it, uh, uh, PMS also. So uh, could you please just uh, take us that uh, 
you know, what's the need of PMS or mutual fund ironics enough? What's your take on it? Sure. So my personal opinion is that most people should choose mutual funds and not uh, choose PMS and AIFs in a big way. And the reason is purely to do with costs and taxes. So the uh, typical fee structure in a mutual fund will be lower than a comparable fee structure in a PMS or a AIF. And uh, tax efficiency is also there. So uh, given that dividends are now taxable and given that uh, short-term gains are taxable at a higher rate as compared to long-term gains and things like that, there are certain tax advantages to investing in a mutual fund. But if there's a specific manager that the end investor likes and would want to invest only with that manager uh, who's running a PMS or who's running a AIF and that person does not manage a mutual fund, then one can choose to uh, go the PMS route. But again, it's for the uh, really wealthy. So minimum ticket size is 50 lakhs for a PMS and 1 crore for a AIF and some managers may have their own higher limits so yeah. it's not accessible to a lot of uh, retail investors okay. Okay. good uh, thank you and uh, I, there are there are uh, you know so many uh, uh, insights and uh, uh, got and uh, uh, i have many more <laughs> to discuss also but uh, one thing which i uh, you know always want to hear from you um, wherever I have seen that uh, you always come up with a very uh, humble and uh, you uh, keep your uh, level very uh, modest. Uh, how do you do this? Uh, you know, having uh, this knowledge and everything and uh, uh, how do you keep very, uh, you know, calm and composed nature? Uh, you know, <laughs> when you speak, uh, I, I always respect the way the, 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 the uh, modulation you have when you're speaking. So uh, it will be good that uh, whenever you go up the ladder or move, move on responsibilities, how you keep that. That advice is always good for personally me and uh, our audience also. So, so about, <laughs> uh, I'll take it in two parts, one about humility and other about keeping calm. Uh, so humility is, let's say I have skill sets in a particular area. Someone else may have a skill set in a different area and uh, all of us work together as a society and help each other uh, live a good and meaningful life. So uh, just like a doctor would invest with us and take benefit from our investment expertise, we would go to a doctor for their medical expertise or uh, we would go to a lawyer for their legal expertise. So we uh, have interdependency. No one is uh, a superhero or a, a superwoman in that sense. We all are interdependent and one has to respect that. And there's no reason for anybody to be uh, arrogant or look down upon anyone else. Uh, as far as staying calm, I think I've been lucky that uh, the organization that uh, I work for does not have these short-term pressures or does not believe in taking shortcuts or uh, has a clear articulated long-term thinking, which if you do that work and then uh, the ups and downs of the market keep coming and one has to take them in that stride. And luckily for us, we have had the good fortune of having uh, distributor partners, of having advisors, of having uh, end clients, all of whom are more or less aligned with the philosophy. And we keep reiterating what process we follow and why we do certain things. So once those alignments are there, uh, one can stay calm. So. Uh, in Kerala, we see these wonderful boat races, right? Uh -huh. And everyone is synchronized, everyone is rowing in the same direction. Then there's no friction. Okay. If some people are 
rowing at a different speed or some people are rowing in a different direction, then the conflict arises or then the calm is lost. Otherwise, one can stay calm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great, uh, great, uh, you know, even example also from Kerala. <laughs> That's good. Uh, sir, uh, just to, you know, out of the interest, uh, uh, what are your, uh, uh, you know, other activities or what are your readings, um, you know, other than you do your uh, routine job? So reading is in two categories. One is the uh, work-related reading, which... Uh, involves uh, biographies of uh, business leaders in India and abroad, investment books and things like that. So that is one kind of reading. The other kind of reading is on uh, various aspects. So uh, some of it could be related to fiction in terms of the uh, novels, etc. that I read, or some of it could be areas that are of interest uh, it could be things like, let's say, space and universe and origins of okay. the universe, or it could be about general history and things like that. So various kinds of reading. Okay. Very good. Any, any books uh, you have, any examples which, uh, any the best autobiographies which you, you like? The uh, one recently that I read was uh, on so Narottam Sikhsariya. He wrote about his journey in terms of setting up Gujarat Ambuja cement and uh, things like that. That was quite interesting. Okay, very good. Very good. Thank you. I will uh, check out. And what's your uh, final advice to uh, this audience uh, on investing and uh, at the same time having a happy and peaceful life? I think the. Uh, one troubling sign that I see uh, is that with the availability of uh, so many products, so many goods and services, uh, people are too worried about lifestyle upgrades. And what that does is that creates a lot of stress and that uh, prevents financial security from coming in. So I am not advocating people to live poor and die rich and just keep accumulating money. That is not the advice at all. But if all the time you are going to go on increasing your EMI, so you start with a cycle and then you go to a motorcycle and then you go to a premium motorcycle and then you go to a Rolls Royce, or all the time if you are borrowing money to buy those things, then your EMI will keep increasing and your insecurity will keep increasing. So for a certain period of time, let your savings and investments build up, build financial security. And then if you can afford it, aspire for better things rather than be in a stress to continuously uh, buy new and new things to impress other people, but big, taking stress while doing that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, you know this is something which uh, uh, we align a lot because uh, even though uh, my service always about investment. Uh, we also uh, do a lot of educations around how to come out of debt and uh, what's the kind of uh, inspiration they can take in order to get out of debt. So there are so many uh, incidents that people just call us and just to tell thanks. Uh, they don't have any other requirement, but uh, because of few of the content, they could got the motivation to, um, you know, go and. Uh, talk to the bank and ask them to reduce the interest rate. Earlier, they would have taken interest at uh, 14 percentage, and they did not know that uh, home loan interest has reduced. And after hearing the content, they thought that, okay, to check, double check, then they understood that, okay, interest can be reduced. So those th it's, it's a very much aligned to, sir, what you said. It. And uh, thank you so much uh, for taking out uh, time for us. Uh, you have uh, with us one hour. And uh, uh, yeah, usually uh, interview can be there only for uh, 30 minutes and everything. But uh, uh, the way you are saying and the kind of learning I got, uh, couldn't really stop it. And uh, I, I have taken that time out. I know that you you were looking at the market and uh, uh, after immediately you have 
given the time for us. Thank you so much for taking uh, time out. Thank, thank you for you. the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.